It's been a couple of weeks of pretty intense protests and riots around the world. I think it's very interesting then that this story comes up for us today. Because today we examine what is probably the most well-known of all the stories in the life of Elijah, the showdown on Mount Carmel. Elijah, the last prophet of the one true God versus hundreds of prophets of Baal and Asherah. This is about whose God is more real, whose God is more powerful, but it's also more than that, much more than that. This is a showdown between the gods, systems of religion, systems of government, ways of thinking, and culture. In the ancient world, everything was taught and understood in terms of gods. You know, every, every home had a god, every family, every workplace, every event, every season, everything had its own little god. And a different one for every person. So, for instance, as a parent these days, you, you, where you might hear someone say, my house, my rules, and they're talking about a, a set of rules, a set of beliefs or a set of values that they have in that home and, and are shared by the people who live there. In the ancient world, those rules, those values, those beliefs were about the God of the house, as values and beliefs, you know, um, let, let me try and make this. Um, when you were growing up, I assume there were rules in your house. One of the most common ones, I guess, for everybody is, is curfew, right? If it's um, school night, you know, you have to go to bed at a certain time. If you're able and if you can remember, maybe you could comment in the YouTube or Facebook chat below what time was your curfew on a school night when you're in high school, secondary school, maybe earlier. Well, in the ancient world, instead of saying, in our house, uh, kids need to go to bed by nine o'clock on a school night, they would say something more like, the God of our house, insert name here, whoever that is, decrees that all children go to bed by 9 p.m. in this house. You see, everything was taught and understood in terms of the gods. When it comes to then the rules of government, the highest laws of the land, justice itself, then those rules were the rules of the chief god, the highest god. Now, if you were Greek, that was Zeus, and if you were Egyptian, that's Ra, but if you're from the Middle East, it was Baal. And that's who we're talking about today. Ahab and Jezebel, king and queen, were the most evil pair that ever ruled Israel, and they justified their actions in their own minds <laughs> because they told themselves they were following Baal and Asherah now. They, they could hunt down and kill people who didn't agree with them, for instance. And that's okay, because it was the Baal way. So when Elijah stands up and says, Yahweh is the one true God, he's saying a lot more than we might think. This is not an argument between Catholics and Protestants or Christians and Buddhists. This is one man who stands up and says, the whole system is rotten. Politics and government, the whole system is broken. The people are in decay. The nation is dying. He argues that the whole system has to be thrown out, that a new system, based on the principles taught by Yahweh, needs to be brought into, into effect. Principles, right? Like, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Principles that apply to people individually, but also as a nation. You know, the first commandment in the Old Testament is, is this, you, you shall have no other gods before me. See, this first commandment is not just about the, which holy book you read. It's not just about which God you pray to. This is about the whole of your life. It's about what God or what values you orient your whole life towards. It's about how you set up your life, what values you have in your life, what purposes you have in your life. It's about everything, this one commandment. 800 years later, a legal expert throws a question at Jesus. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. God, Yahweh, needs to be the first priority in our lives. The first consideration, the first consultation, the first thought. But I also like the fact that even though Jesus was asked for only one answer, he gives two, because it's also about justice. It's inseparable. 
Time and time again in the Old Testament, the people were commanded to take care of the poor, the widows, the orphans, the aliens, the foreigners. To leave no one behind in their building of a better and more prosperous society according to the rules and precepts of Yahweh. As individuals, as families, as communities, and as a nation. So you see, this is what it's all about. When Elijah speaks out against Baal, he is making a political, moral, social, and spiritual stand. So God tells Elijah to go and confront Ahab because Ahab is making some pretty poor decisions, some unjust decisions. Ahab has made some decisions in leading the poor people according to the precepts of Baal, and people are dying. Through Elijah, God tells Ahab that there isn't going to, there's going to be a drought. Right? And drought's not that unusual. It's the Middle East, there's a lot of desert and not a lot of rain. Not expected. But this time, Elijah says it's not going to rain until he prays and asks God to make it rain, which he's not going to do until God tells him to pray and ask for rain. All of this is also a little bit ironic, right? Because like Zeus, Baal is, among other things, the storm god. You know, a drought is proof that Baal is powerless. Anyway, so here's where we get to the part of the story Caitlin talked about from last week, right? Ahab puts a bounty on Elijah's head and Elijah flees to the Kerith Ravine, as per God's instructions. And there, for a season, God takes care of him until the brook where he gets his water every day dries up because of drought. And God says, don't worry, go and hide out with the widow and her son over in Zarephath. Some miraculous things happen while he stays there. Things that again teach Elijah about the power of God and the provision of the one true God. If you missed last week's message, I really encourage you to go back into the YouTube feed and, and find Caitlin's message and listen to it. It's gold. Well, our story today takes place after this. You know, Elijah has been hiding out with the widow for about three years. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Finally, right? Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. Well, after a bit of a convoluted process involving a, a true God-fearing palace administrator named Obadiah, Elijah finally gets his meeting with King Ahab. Jezebel is not there, unsurprisingly, she's off hunting down and killing followers of Yahweh. Well, Ahab calls Elijah a troubler of Israel, a snake, a rabble rouser, a rebel leader. Well, Elijah responds. He says, uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 18, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands. You've abandoned the Lord's values and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and, and bring 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who sit and eat at Jezebel's table. 400 prophets or so at Jezebel's table? That's a big table, right? So, in front of a crowd of what we think is probably thousands of people, two animals are sacrificed and the first God to light a fire is going to show the thousands of people watching who the one true God is. And with that demonstration, the whole of Israel will turn back to God. At least, that is Elijah's hope. One thing we are very aware of in Australia is that lightning is really good at lighting fires, particularly in a dry season. And as I said before, Baal is the storm god. You know, in some Ugaritic carvings, he is actually pictured holding lightning bolts. And you would think... Hundreds of prophets should be pretty confident that their God could light a fire. But as confident as they were, nothing was happening when they prayed. And they prayed for hours. They started in the morning and it wasn't at noon. I think Elijah's getting a bit bored. He starts mocking them, which I think is hilarious. In 1 Kings 18 verse 27, at noon, Elijah begins to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is good. Uh, he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought, or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and has got to be woken up. I love this verse, because you know what? It's another example of the English translators of the Bible being a little bit politically correct. Because you see, where Elijah suggests that Baal is busy, what he's actually saying is, maybe Baal is doing his business on the toilet. <laughs> English translators are a little bit prim, right? 
not so Elijah, he's hilarious. Well, it had the desired effect. Elijah's uh, taunting. The other prophets went even harder, dancing, and they started cutting themselves and stuff. I don't know what that's supposed to do, but they were pretty serious. But what it goes to show is that they weren't playing. They weren't pretending. They genuinely believed that Baal and Baal's ways were best, were real, were effective. Elijah's whole showdown was a demonstration designed to show the people the powerlessness of the false God and the power of the one true God. Because sure enough, verse 36, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And the fire of the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up all the water in the trenches. And all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. Yahweh, He is God. You know, we still worship false gods today. We don't give them names. Sometimes we give them ideologies, but they do take our attention. They do twist our thinking away from justice. They give us false purposes. They cause us to question our values. You look at the society around us. We value money, possessions, prosperity, pleasure and power far higher in some places than justice. False gods, though, promise what only the true God can provide. If we want to be a strong and prosperous nation, we need to be a nation founded on the principles of God. Principles of love, justice and equality taught and demonstrated by Jesus, the Son of God. We need a nation where no one is given extra special treatment, but also no one is left behind, where everyone is given equal opportunity. No one is discriminated against or treated unjustly, and nobody is left behind. That's what God stands for. That's what we stand for. And I pray that that is what you stand for. While women weep, as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry, as they do now, I'll fight. While men go into prison, in and out, in and out, as they do now, I'll fight. Where there is a drunkard left, where there is a poor lost girl upon the streets, where there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight, I'll fight to the very end.